We're, we're really um, uh, very delighted to have Faith Saley with us uh, this evening. You know, up until last month, uh, Faith hadn't been scheduled to, uh, to come to D.C. for, uh, for uh, an author talk, but my wife and I ran into her at the annual book expo, which was in Chicago this year, and uh, she told us how much she'd like to do an event, uh, particularly here at, at Bus Boys. So we're very, uh, very glad that, that things worked out. Uh, her new memoir, Approval Junkie, is a, is a very revealing and, and very funny um, book, but um, it also delivers an, an important message. Uh, it's a message about self-worth and self-confidence and, and doing your best to, to win approval from yourself, um, not, not primarily to, to please others. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily uh, know it looking at Faith's successful career as an actress, a comedian, a, um, uh, a TV and radio host, um, but behind all that accomplishment, uh, intelligence, uh, humor, and, and physical attractiveness, um, Most importantly. Case, it, case, it, case it wasn't Can you obvious. please write an Amazon review immediately? Case, case it wasn't obvious. Um, but behind all that uh, was a, a, a long, uh, for a long time was a, a swirl of, of, of insecurities and a driving desire to win the approval of others. In her book, uh, Faith recounts some of the, uh, the crazy lengths she's gone to uh, over the years to please people and how far she's now come in, in refocusing herself and finding happiness. Uh, she, she calls herself a, a recovering junkie uh, and says she no longer grovels for validation. Uh, but make no mistake, a part of her uh, doesn't want to totally recover, so I'm sure she wouldn't mind if you all show her you really want her book <laughs> and go buy it th this evening and, and have her sign it. Uh, she's, she's in conversation uh, here this evening with Mario Correa, who's a longtime friend of Faith's. And, um, and, and who, who worked with her in, uh, in public radio. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Faith and, and Mario. Thank you so much. I, I should also say that Mario is a, a wonderful playwright and, uh, and a radio host, and, and also um, the first man I asked to have a baby with me, and thank God you said no. I said no, yeah. <laughs> Because it led me, there's a chapter in my book called JSAP, which is an acronym, my friend Danny, he happens to be the guy who wrote the Festivus episode of Seinfeld, he's very funny. He, um, I sound like Donald Trump, he's a very funny man. Um, uh, he nicknamed my courtship with my now husband JSAP, which stands for the Jewish Semen Acquisition Program, which was successful and you could not have provided me with Jewish no, semen. No, I could not no, have, so. Latino semen. <laughs> Um, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. There are many people I know and have known for years, including my brother, um, and, and many people I don't know, and that uh, means at least as much, maybe even more. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you for sort of squeezing this event in after a, a Pride weekend that has had its ups and horrific downs. Um, I uh, uh, thank you for being here on a day when something so awful happened. I thank God that we have a president, at least right now, who, who spoke about it so eloquently and meaningfully. Um, and I hope we can all enjoy ourselves a little bit tonight so that the terrorists didn't win. Um, yes. And then we'll get you home in time to go to the Tonys. So. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of a couple different things. Faith is gonna read from the book in a little bit. I'm gonna ask you to do some reading. I was afraid you're starting like an improv game. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are we doing? And, yes. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna start by asking you a question from the book. And this is a question that someone that you had paid good money to, a coach, someone who you were paying asked you this question. So I'm gonna ask it of you now. Faith. Why aren't you as pretty as I want you to be? Yes. Explain, yes. please. Explain. Yes. Who would laugh? Um, I did pay someone uh, $130 to ask me that question. Um, and that was like 12 years ago. So it's worth like $4,000 now. Um, 
uh, it, she, I was an actor in LA, um, and she was this acting guru named Leslie Kahn, and her devotees called her acting school the Constitute, um, <laughs> which made me wish that you know Ricardo Mont- Montalban would be there, like waiting for me to run lines. Um, that was a Wrath of Khan reference. There aren't a lot of Star Trek fans. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Drinks for them. Um, yeah, so I, I was going through this period in my life and in my career. I just married my first husband. I call him my husband in the book. Um, and that marriage wasn't going very well. I kept sort of hoping that he would... I kept auditioning for him to cast me as his dream girl and even though we were married I still wasn't getting the role um, and I my auditions were sucking and I went I mean this was like the nadir of, of this pilot season and I went to an audition and and the person going in before me was um, Justine Bateman nay Mallory Keaton you, yes, yes you know and and then I looked to see who was going in after me and it was Tracy Lords that's Tracy with an I the porn star right and so I, I I was like, what am I doing? What, like, who, who am I? Who am I supposed to be? And I went in and I gave a really awful audition. And I was, as I was leaving, I see someone coming in with her game face on. And it was Victoria Jackson in acid-washed shorts overalls. And I was like, I need help with my career. So my, my manager told me I had to go see this woman, Leslie Kahn, for, for help with this audition. And I went to the Constitute. And... Um, uh, I went in for this 25-minute session where all I had to do was like read my lines. I had an audition I was preparing for. I read my lines in front of her, and it was a dark, it was like this serene candlelit room with these long red velvet curtains. And she sat in the back, and she was she was really kind of nurturing for someone who runs really? the Constitute. <laughs> um, and she was like you know that sh- that kind of waxy, unlined look that in LA means you could be 20 or 60, you know. <laughs> And, and when I was done, she looked, at, she looked at me like this. She was like, and she was looking at me with such sort of intense, compassionate curiosity. I, I swear to God, I thought she was going to be like, why aren't you a massive star? And instead, she said, why aren't you as pretty as I want you to be? And you guys might find that appalling or gasp <laughs> at that, but um, that would mean you're healthy. Um, um, and I... At that point, I, I mean, I wasn't as pretty as I wanted me to be. And, you know, especially for an approval junkie and someone who's seeking validation externally, especially in L.A., when you're want, when your whole, if you're an actor, your whole career is about having people choose you and think you're the prettiest or the funniest or the winsomest or whatever. Yeah. Ist. Um, and, uh, and so that question didn't offend me. I mean, I wanted to know how I could be uh, pretty enough as pretty as Leslie Kahn wanted me to be, and I, and I could tell, I could tell she was thinking about how to solve this, and I was l- waiting with bated breath, and I was terrified she was going to tell me I had to become a Scientologist or, like, do a kombucha colonic or something, and um, and finally she was like, bangs, you need bangs. <laughs> They are totally, you, you look desperately unhappy and they're gonna soften your desperation. And I, and I was desperately unhappy. And I was like, yeah, like this, I, I can do this. And as I was walking out, she kind of like, from the back of this candlelit room, she was like, oh, one more thing. Are you a mother? And I was 35 and I wanted to be a mother, but um, my husband didn't want to have sex with me. Um, so that wasn't fast approaching. and. Um, and I just said, no, not yet, I want to be, why? And she said, because you're meant to be a mother and I'm gonna see you again in the future and you're gonna be a mother and you're gonna be softer and you're gonna be fulfilled and you're, you're going to know what's really important. And I walked out of there and I got into, I had leased this BMW because I wanted to feel like a baller and I called my husband and I was like, something amazing just happened. I need to have bangs. And, and then, and then a, a decade later, I had, I lived in a new city and I had a new husband and I had a new career and I had two kids and, and, no, bangs. and no bangs because they're way too much of a commitment. But, but I, um, I, I, she had her own kind of wisdom. I, I, I wasn't as pretty as I wanted me to be either because I was desperately unhappy.
and I have a huge forehead, okay? <laughs> mentioned in the book is sitcom where you were a character, but you could could probably tell folks that you yes. had... Yes. Can you hear Mario? Is he going in and out? Am I going, He's in, going in, in and out, right? All right. I'll hold it closer there. Um, no, I don't think it's your yeah? fault. Okay. Is it... Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yes, my, my husband was a producer, and at that time, he had created a show with Lauren Michaels, and he had created a part for me, and the character's name was Hope, and, of course, I'm Faith, and I didn't get the part. And, and that wasn't his fault. He tried, but the but the I mean, this is how it goes in, in Hollywood. The, the the Lauren Michaels was like, great, she's great. And the president of ABC saw a tape of me, and he was like, she needs bangs. No, I'm just kidding. No, he saw a tape of me, and he was like, nope, she's I I and you know she, the president of ABC didn't know I was this right. man's wife, and he just said, no, I don't like her. We need somebody else. Imagine that it must be a particularly low point when your husband creates a series for I you, and a part you. That, as your son. I couldn't play myself. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't play myself. You were too old to play yourself. <laughs> I was yeah. too old to play myself. It's true. <laughs> um, we have lots to talk about, but I want you to read from the books. I think folks will get a great idea of, of how funny and smart and literate it is. Um, I was going to suggest the chapter on Miss Aphrodite, who you call Miss Afro. Miss Afro. Miss yes, Afro, was, um, which I'll let you set up. And okay, this... Um this will give you a sense of, you know, when I picked out this dress, it seemed like a good idea, but it is extremely <laughs> short in this Alice in Wonderland chair, too. <laughs> okay, so sorry. Um, when I graduated, so this is called Miss Aphrodite. When I graduated from North Springs High School in Atlanta, Georgia, home of the Spartans, the most famous alumnus was one John Schneider, AKA Bo Duke, thank you, you're my people. Um, more, more recent notable grads are Usher and Raven Simone, and you can decide on your, for yourself who's more famous based on your appreciation of R&B versus a bizarrely silent accent aigu. <laughs> of course, I myself am famous among certain circles. If you can make a circle out of three people, those three would be my dad, my dad's accountant, who kindly asks for updates on my career, and the one Star Trek Uber fan who possesses the collectible trading card featuring me as genetically enhanced mutant Serena Douglas. I, thank you. I can say this about all those NSHS celebrities who are way starrier than I. None of them was crowned Miss Aphrodite. Now that my old high school is a charter school and we're in the 21st century, I'm pretty sure they've shut down the beauty and talent pageant that marked the highlight of my time as a Spartan. If you're shocked that a public high school held a pageant for its girls every spring, then your people were probably on the chilly side of the war of northern aggression. <laughs> so um, the deal with Miss Aphrodite was you could, you could not win unless you were a senior. Um, and I knew this, and I knew I had to pay my dues, but I was ready to try every year. So I always got the French club to, yeah, a club had to nominate you, and the French club always nominated me because nobody else wanted to do it, but I preferred to think they recognized a je ne sais quoi in me. Um, and I did, I don't mean to brag, but I did get first runner up freshman year, and I, I chalked that near win up to two things. One um, was the cobalt blue spandex unitard I wore, and thank you. And two um, was my pandering answer during the interview portion. It's hard to compete with cobalt spandex, but it's easy to compete in it, my friends. <laughs> Especially when you add bright red dance panties over it that keep giving you a wedgie while you earnestly sing nothing from a chorus line. Great song. Thank you. Nothing, yeah. my, my friend Mario here is from Chile. Nothing is a song for a Latina character yeah. <laughs> named Morales. And I am the whitest person on earth, but I sang the shit out of that song. <laughs> Thank you. About, about is, tobogganing in Puerto Rico, about right? About tobogganing in Puerto Rico, yeah, which yeah, I know yeah. so well. Uh -huh. um, it's kind of easy to do because if you've ever heard the song, it's basically spoken. Yeah. Um, I let my shiny unitard do the real singing. The judges would pick five of us for the interview round. You could qualify to judge Miss Aphrodite if you did something like run a real estate company or predict the weather on a local station or hold the title of Mrs. Peach Tree City, 1983. Freshman year, I'd already decided that no matter what my interview question was, I would answer, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> um, that seemed to be clutch. 
especially in Atlanta in the 80s when the city's slogan was the catchy, this is real, Atlanta, the city too busy to hate. <laughs> but now they've got lots of time. Yeah. It just so happened that my answer lined up stunningly with my question, which was, what person do you admire most and why? Of course, I did genuinely admire what I knew of MLK, but at that point in my life, the most truthful answer would probably have been Molly Ringwald because she is so awesome and then some. Um, so the competition, um, this was not a school for the arts, and you really had to be creative in your mediocrity if you wanted to have a chance. So there was a lot of Sheena Easton being sung, but not my sugar walls, sadly. Um, there was, oh, there was Wendy Teratoot. I have to do this without flashing everybody. There was Wendy Teratoot who sang the entire song of the rose, which you may recall is like four minutes wrong, with her hand mysteriously behind her back. And on the very last note, in the spring becomes the rose. Um, there was, um, there was Melissa Terrell who sang Your Cheatin' Heart and dedicated it to her dad. Um, <laughs> And there, oh, my favorite was Laura DG, who came out in jodhpurs and a pith, and a riding helmet and um, rolled a, you know, like this size TV behind her with a VHS player and she hit play and she played a video of her riding her horse and possibly breaking her hymen um, to, the, to the soundtrack from, the love song from St. Elmo's Fire. Um, <laughs> So, so, you know, I went through sophomore year, I went through junior year, I pulled out a Liza Minnelli song. Um, and then uh, senior year, I decided I had to do two things to win. One was I decided I needed to lose 45 pounds. And the other uh, thing was I hired a pageant coach named Valerie Kennedy, who was like the Bella Caroli of pageant <laughs> coaches in the South. Like, people came to her far and wide. Like, you, sir, could become like Miss Gwinnett <laughs> County if, <laughs> if, if Valerie Kennedy got her hands on you. So Valerie chose my song for me, which was the world's worst slash best uh, Barbara Streisand song from a musical called Funny Lady. Not Funny Girl. Yeah. I love you. You have every reference. We're like this. <laughs> so this song is called Let's Hear It For Me. You know that song? It's terrible, right? <laughs> it's terrible. Like, the, 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 real, the killer verse was, um, I'm the number one attraction to see. Come on, kids, let's hear it for me. And then the other thing Valerie taught me to do was this pageant arm raise. And um, so this comes at the end of the song. And um, you please, if you will, have to picture me in a micro mini rainbow sequin skirt I had ordered from the Avon catalog, and um, like Nine West patent leather pumps, and massive crunchy perm. On, um, my, my senior year book picture, my, head, my hair's cut off. That's how <laughs> tall it was. And so you take the, you take the, what did you say? Still no bangs. Still no bangs. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the height. You take the, uh, uh, what's this called, the microphone, and you put it in your downstage hand, theater geeks know this, and so you're gonna, you're gonna squat, and I'm sorry Bradley, I really shouldn't have worn the skirt, and, um, and you've got your upstage hand just straight as can be, it's gonna be at six o'clock, and then you're gonna bring it up to effing high noon, like completely straight, and you're gonna follow it, looking up to God Almighty on the last note of the song, so it was like, come on kids, let's hear it for, me! Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. And you and you you leave it there on the what do they say? That you leave it on the field, right? <laughs> you demonstrate that, that the kids have nothing to do but to hear it for you. And um, <laughs> this is the end of the chapter. Uh, I hope I don't have to tell you it worked. Not to brag or anything, but no one stood a chance against my emaciated, spastic resolve. <laughs> High school obsessions seemed so important at the time. The yearbooks full of senior, senior superlatives. Best legs, best smile, best dressed. I still have my tiara. It's missing, missing a comb to shove it into my hair, and some stones have disappeared. Yes, I'm like a character in a Tennessee Williams play, clinging to the symbol of my salad days. Like, literally just salad, y'all, with dressing on the side. About a week after I won, I received rejection letters from all the Ivies. 
and Jennifer Lindy got to be valedictorian. On prom night, my dad took me out to dinner because no one had asked me. But for one brief shining moment, the Greek gods had smiled on me and welcomed me into their pantheon as Miss Aphrodite, goddess of beauty and love. I love casually telling people I won my high school pageant. In the Northeast, in this century, it sounds positively exotic. I faux brag about being Miss Aphrodite 1989 because it's so ridiculous, but the truth is, I have a wistfulness about it. I remember it clearly as one of the last times I set goals to dominate my body and to captivate the student body, certain I could achieve them through sheer determination. That's a faith that belongs to the young because you learn soon enough that life doesn't work that way and wishing hard and working hard don't always stick a crown atop your ephemerally skinny body. Thank you. I love, I love that chapter and so many others where you detail how important it was for you to persevere and you would push yourself to these limits. I'm curious where this whole need for approval comes from. Have you, I, I, cause you, you, I don't know if you say in the book, this is why I needed this or why I need this. Wh where do you think it does come from? Um, it, it would be really lame to say, I don't know. I, I know that it always felt good to get it. So it just, I also know, it, I know that it doesn't come from having parents who didn't love me enough or weren't supportive enough. And maybe, and so, Maybe, you know, my mom was my gateway drug because my mother relentlessly complimented me. I mean, I, I remember, I remember co like crying when my college boyfriend, I was home from school, my college boyfriend broke up with me and my mom like stopped me while I was crying. She was like, honey, I'm sorry to interrupt because I know you're upset, but I just have to tell you, you're so pretty when you cry. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I could withstand people like Leslie Kahn. I mean, uh -huh. you know, um, I, I, just, I just had like, consistent um, uh, levels, extreme levels of approbation from my mom. And I had a dad who uh, very calmly and, and just very occasionally but ceremoniously would say, you know, if I made straight A's or got the lead in a play or something, he'd say, I'm impressed but I'm not surprised. And it was like, oh, that's so good. I want more of that. I want more right, of that. Right. And, and, and I think, I mean, any, any kid who, who learns early on, I mean, I, look, I see it with my own kids. They're two and they're four. And the delight that they get when I applaud because they eat their vegetables or whatever. You know, th it's a milestone for children to receive validation. Yeah. And I wouldn't know. I've never gotten validated. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, at some point, we're magically supposed to grow out of uh, admitting that it feels good. Um, I mean, I think that the evolution, at least for my, me and my story, has to be, as Bradley so eloquently put it, um, has to be seeking it from yourself. And, um, and or, or from the right people. Like, yeah. um, I work on two shows now, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and CBS Sunday Morning, and I was, I've been a fan of Sunday Morning since I was a kid, and Wait, Wait for years. And, and so when I get to be on them, if I get great feedback, if the, with my co-panelists laugh, that feels great. I'm not gonna pretend it doesn't. Or if I get an email from the executive producer of Sunday Morning that says, like, great job, it yeah. feels fantastic because I respect and admire these people. But it's been a lesson in, you know, learning to shed people like casting directors or my husband who, or a scale from whom I was never gonna get enough validation. Um, but I will say our, our mother uh, was, was a woman who used to pray the rosary while doing sit-ups. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is someone who set an example of kind of doing things right and doing them efficiently. Um, you raise your husband, which is a, a fascinating um, part of the book, and you, it strikes me as the case where the approval junkie in you went haywire. This is a relationship that was based on this need for approval. Tell, tell the folks here who, who haven't read the book about your husband and your relationship, because it is a, a, a big part of this book. Um, the dynamic, which is fascinating, it, it's almost indescribable. I'm, I want to hear how you describe your marriage. It is almost indescribable, which is why it was so hard to write. I mean, it was, um, my husband uh, was and presumably is uh, a, a very like powerful, gregarious, handsome, tall, you met him, mm -hmm. extremely charismatic. Um, 
uh, man, and we met at a, I think a lot of people, people may not have had a relationship like this to the extreme I did, but I think a lot of people can relate. It's, you, you meet at a certain um, vulnerable time, right? I'm, I met my ex-husband a uh, year after my mom died and I had just left grad school where I was on a scholarship and everything was amazing and paid for and I moved to LA and I want to be a sitcom star and it just doesn't happen like that. And I'm 3,000 miles away from my family and I don't have a mother anymore and I met him and he had just, he had lost his brother a few years ago before that and he had just um, had cancer twice. And this is a man in his, his 25 and he had beaten it and we, both sort of felt like we found healing in each other. And it was so, you know those magical first days when you meet and you fall in love and, and, and you, I kept chasing that. You know, in a good healthy relationship, as we all know, it just keeps getting better and better. Or you recognize flaws in your partner, but they're okay. But with us, it started so amazingly well and, uh, and it was like the perfect fit for an approval junkie because he was, he could, he could give me approval that made me feel like I was on top of the world, but he, he, he giveth and he would taketh away much more often. Um, and I was just constantly, uh, like I said, auditioning to be his dream girl. I wanted to be back up on that pedestal. Um, and that was one of the toughest parts of writing the book. It is, uh, there's, I would say only like the first third of the book mentions him. Um, but I, my, um, my editor kept saying, I, I have to understand why this relationship didn't work because you were so crazy in love with him. And, and it was hard because it wasn't a narrative, like it wasn't that he cheated on me. It wasn't that one of us, you know, I came home and he found me in a sex swing on a coke binge with somebody else. Like, it, it that wasn't, was your second husband. <laughs> right. It wasn't a, a clean, it was, and neither of us said, I just don't love you anymore. It just wasn't, it wasn't a clean severance and that those are sometimes the most um, destructive and, and unhappy making relationships when you st I mean this is a lame answer but like karma I mean we had to we had to be together to realize that we weren't meant to be together and and for me it was a lesson in realizing uh, that I could I was worthy of finding someone who loved me all the time and not just sometimes it's one of the things My I think. My brother is, hated him, so he has to leave the room. Yeah, <laughs> I do remember. I, you know, I met him, and he, he was he was cute. It, is that why you're with him? Do you think just because he was attractive? Because I I thought at the end of the day I was like maybe that's what it was. He was just really was extreme. Do you think yeah. he was extremely attractive? Yeah, yeah but, I just want to yeah. get down to the bottom of that one. Um, <laughs> but I'm curious about what was left sort of on the cutting room floor, not just in that story, but in others, because I know that when you put a memoir together. I can just imagine how much sort of editing and self-editing goes in. And I also know that your editors pushed you to go deeper on some story. Tell us about the process of writing this and deciding what's funny enough, what's um, substantive enough, what's too private. How did you make those decisions? Um, this, I'll begin to answer that question by circling back to my husband a little bit. It is, it is also, a, it is also a challenge to present a whole. Like I wanted to write about my mother, but in many ways she deserves a whole book. So thinking about how can I talk about this person who was so instrumental in my being an approval junkie, and finding my own way after she died. Like how do you, how do you present someone who's gone? And the same with my husband. And you, and you kind of. Have to, there was a lot of cutting of my husband, but then I had to rely, that means that the details that you choose to show have to be so dense, right? So there's a chapter early on in the book where I talk about um, the nicknames that my ex-husband would call me, like the sweet nothings. There's a name for that, it's called hypocrisy. the little, the sweet names that you call your, your beloved. And, and my husband um, had really creative ones that were like, uh, just like, probably 50, and I always, they were like competitive and sweet, and, and, and the, and I thought they were sweet, and in the end, when I looked at them, they were like psychic noogies, you know? When I, when I would compare them to what my now, my now husband, he calls me baby, and I know that's ubiquitous, but no one had ever called me that before, and it, and it, it speaks to the way he treats me, like, you're mine and I'll take care of you. Um, and so, I had to think of, without writing a whole book about my husband, I had to think of these details. So one of them is uh, on every computer he ever had, so that was back in the days before everybody just had an iPad or a laptop, um, he had three computers, and on each of them there was a screensaver in all caps that would roll constantly across the computer. It just said, I will always win. And 
And that, and, and when I first met him, I was like, that is so hot. <laughs> it's like, that's what he said to cancer, and that's what he's gonna say to everything in life. And then, you know, you get to the point where you're in front of a judge getting a divorce, and you're like, wow, you just always wanna win, don't you, you know? And he, and he didn't win by marrying me. But you have to rely, when you think about the editing, you have to rely on details like that. And the same with, like, tells you a lot when I tell you that my mom did the rosary while she was doing sit-ups, or she drove a 280ZX stick shift and in the console she kept a Bible because she, at long stoplights she wanted to make sure she got to reading the Bible. Like she didn't want to didn't waste any time. Or, or she'd pull over her car if she, if she saw where we grew up there was a, a there was like a chain gang. It makes it, uh, yes, I was born in 1893. Um, <laughs> And, and if she saw the chain gang, she would go home, bake pumpkin bread, race back in the 280ZX, and give loaves of pumpkin bread to the leader of the, to the police, the, the officer there. Um, so it's, it's, it's part of the editing process is relying on really evocative details. Um, part of the editing process when it came to my husband was trying to discern what is my story and what is his story. And his story should only enter into my story in order, in a fair way. You know, um, one thing my editor asked me to do, um, which surprised me, was to try, she wanted me to humanize him. He deserves that. I mean, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she would say, try, try to imagine, you don't have to put words in his mouth, but try to imagine what this episode must have felt like. Like I write in the book about when he proposed to me and how it was, it was year, we had been dating years and years and years and years. and. When I had first told him I loved him, he said, I know. And so of course, being an approval junkie, I was like, I I'm gonna get him to say he loves me. Uh, and, but when he finally proposed to me years later, I felt like some Pyrrhic victory by not saying yes right away, by yeah. like making him wait. Now I only made him wait like, can you hear me still? I only made him wait like, I don't know, 10 seconds, but that's a long time. I wasn't crying and <laughs> jumping up and down. I had on Chanel sunglasses and I was like, you know? <laughs> and that is soul withering. Like I may have felt like I was powerful then, but that's soul withering. We yeah. had this really competitive dynamic. Um, um, oh, why did I bring that up? Because my editor was saying, try to imagine how he must have felt in that situation. Um, and interestingly, you guys are book lovers presumably, so you know Mary Carr, you know the writer Mary Carr, yeah. the amazing memoirist. I met her at an event a couple months ago and we were talking about writing memoir and what's fair game. And, and I was mentioning this, that my editor asked me to humanize my husband by doing this. And she's like, Mary Carr was like, that's horrible. That's like, that's like commandment number one. You never do that. You never presume about somebody else. But I felt, and you know, what do I know? Mary Carr's a New York Times bestseller. But, um, but I felt like that was very therapeutic and helpful for me yeah. to fill out the story. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of what got edited out I wrote a vomit draft. I wrote, I wrote everything when I first started writing this book. I was so used to writing two and a half minute commentaries for Sunday morning and being like pithy that I just, I wrote everything that ever came into my mind and I trusted my editor to say this isn't gonna work. So I, get, I wrote this book while I was giving birth to my daughter. Like I was actually in labor while I was writing some of the book and then I wrote the rest of the vomit draft the whole summer she was a newborn and I was breastfeeding like 16 times a day. So I was expressing myself in every way. <laughs> and and uh, a lot of what I cut were chapters about like how I wanted to give birth to her without an epidural. And I remember did. that, yeah. And, um, and uh, oh, there was a chapter, I still miss this chapter, but it was insane. It was very short, it was called WW B B C D, and that stands for what would Brooke Burke Charvet do? <laughs> and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it was cut. Exactly. You don't know who Brooke Burke is? Brooke Burke from Baywatch, and then she married David Charvet, and she hyphenated her name, and now she wears Skechers and does commercials for vaginal, I mean, uh, like pelvic incontinence. Well, all right, this is why the chapter was cut. <laughs> She, she has four kids and she advertises this tummy wrap that you're supposed to wrap around you as soon as you give birth so that you shrink back down to a size like negative zero like her. And so I, I, I bought this tummy wrap and I was obsessed with what Brooke Burke Charvet would do with a newborn. And then I did all this research and it turns out her husband, David Charvet, was, was just on Baywatch like one season. He's like yeah. as big as Hasselhoff in, in really? France. And Brooke oh. Burke, she speaks French. She speaks French with her mother-in-law. You guys don't care about this. This is why I was cut. <laughs> 
Anyway. Um, David is here in the front row. Your brother David, one of your two brothers. Um, yay, yay for David. <clears throat> and there is a chapter in the book where you and David, uh, well, guys, David teaches you something very educational. Yeah. That I think in honor of pride you wanted to share with this crowd. If there's yeah. ever a place and time to read a chapter called The Best Hand Job Ever, it would be now. If you brought your children, I'm very, very, very sorry. If you're wondering how my brother taught me how to give the best hand job ever, do you want to take your child out? Is that Greg? Uh, Greg, I'm sorry. What do I do? You are a very cool kid. All right. You're never too young to learn. If, if you're wondering how my brother taught me how to give the best hand job ever, it all began in his Stanford Law torts class. I will render your worst fears flaccid by telling you now that no penises were involved. It was a year after mom died and David and I made it a point to visit each other once a month since we were both in California. So I'd flown up on a Friday and gone with him to his lecture. I brought along some light reading on heavy petting. I nestled the sex manual behind a large folder. The book was called Sex Tips for Straight Women from a Gay Man. It offers a solid premise. Who better to teach you how to please a man than a man who pleases men? I was eager for sex tips because I'd recently started dating my husband. From our first date, I just knew I wanted to marry him. It wasn't even because he told me he was going to be president of the United States, setting off Flotus fantasies in my head. She did not date Barack Obama, by the it way. Was that was not. It was because he was tall and confident and handsome. He had a deep, sexy voice. But there was also something vulnerable about, vulnerable about him because he'd been sick for a very long time. How often do you get to be the first person with whom someone has sex after he finishes chemotherapy? That's remission sex. That's a big deal. I didn't want to let him down in any way. <laughs> sex tips for straight women from a gay man turned out to be more rompy than revelatory, except for a few pointers. And by pointers, I do mean nipples. Men's nipples, which according to this primer, are lonely, evolutionarily impotent accessories just waiting to be noticed. <laughs> I'm not so sure about this tip as I have since attempted to lavish attention on the male nipples of a small sample set and haven't had any takers. Um, I, I did text both of my brothers, the straight one and the gay one, to ask if this is, if this is a thing. And my brother Doug uh, got back to me first. He just said, not my thing. And then David wrote a paragraph. <laughs> I've always wondered about straight guys. Among the gays, it seems to be about 50-50. Half had, have wired nips, and the other half no particularly special sensation. He did not reveal himself to be wired or not, so I will ask you at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> um, so, I don't know what you said, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, I'll, I'll skip a little bit ahead. Um, the book made a very enthusiastic argument for revisiting the hand job, just as a gastronome might once in a while crave a sloppy joe. <laughs> I was persuaded and hungry to try it out, except first I had to fully understand the directions, which, which were surprisingly complex for this meat and potatoes move. <laughs> and that's why I was perched beside my brother in the stadium seating of his 2L towards class, scrutinizing the confusing diagram entitled The Stroke. <laughs> According to the gay man, the key to the stroke was a twisting move. I kept discreetly trying to mimic the pictures full of penises and arrows with one hand while holding up the book and the folder with the other. I prayed the professor wouldn't call on me in a paper chase moment, leaving me no choice but to answer, I haven't done the reading, sir, but I can speak to manu forte ejaculation techniques. <laughs> David noticed my furrowed brow, so I tilted the diagram at him. He quickly studied it and whispered, I'll show you at home. <laughs> It says to practice on a roll of refrigerated cookie dough. I whispered back just to make sure he wasn't planning on whipping out his thang. I mean, we're close, but we're not that close. He nodded solemnly. Perhaps it strikes you as weird that I asked my brother for help when it came to sex, even if he is the brother who knows his way up and around a penis. But you see, I can ask David anything. I can ask anything of him. 
With the possible exception of my husband, I can say that as close as I've been with any man, I've been closer with my brother. John has seen me breastfeed thousands of times, but only with David have I frolicked topless on a beach. John has witnessed we people come out of my magical lady hole. <laughs> but David was with me when I had my uterus rearranged by a resectoscope loop to make room for a potential baby. John has watched me become a mother. David has seen me lose our mother. And I talk more about my relationship with David. Men have come and come, men have come and come again and gone, but not my brother. And so I asked him to teach me the twist. Uh, the rest of the chapter revolves around the uh, somewhat outre things some of us do for approval when it comes to sex. And um, it may or may not include a mention of someone peeing um, on me and there was not a jellyfish in the room. Um, <laughs> And then also this triathlete I dated who accidentally showed a videotape of him having sex with a blonde woman, I'm not blonde, um, to my parents, to my parents, by accident, by accident. He was showing them a home tour of his uh, Palm Beach condo and he had um, very unwisely taped over an old videotape. So my parents were watching him like demonstrate the Jack and Jill bathrooms and then there's this video of him, bra a breaking news flash that <laughs> involved banging. Um, so, let me get to the end of the chapter. In my experience, real intimacy is quiet and it is cumulative. It's made of moments when you're naked with your eyes open and whether or not you have clothes on doesn't matter. I can count on one hand the men with whom I've been truly unblinking and they with me and my brother is one of them. My brother's eyes are open to my flaws and cracks and he still loves me. Intimacy is also spontaneous and organic. It's not something you need to study for even if you find explicit direct instructions in a book, and even if you have a brother willing to explain them to you. There's really no way of knowing if David and I are so close because he's my brother or he's my gay brother. It doesn't matter anyway. He's more than a brother and more than a best friend, and he's better than a sister. I didn't even know he was gay until he came out to me in our 20s over some Chick-fil-A at the Perimeter Mall food court. It was not a Sunday. <laughs> Not a Sunday. Had I a discerning eye for adolescent boy wall art, I might have registered that in my brother Doug's room hung the iconic poster of Farrah Fawcett in her nipply glory, while David's corkboard spotted an 8x10 glossy of Joan Rivers. <laughs> when someone has sung the entire cast recording of Les Mis with you on a convertible road trip in 1987, when years later, after your mother's death, he's walked with you beside the Pacific and talked about when it might feel okay to sing anything ever again. When you've asked him to buy you post-surgical granny panties and enormous thirsty pads the size of European pillow shams to put in them, <laughs> it makes sense to ask this man to show you how to give the best hand job ever, even if he is your brother. <laughs> As we drove from his torts class to my hand job tutorial, I reminded David that the gay man said we should use cookie dough because it has the right consistency. We agreed the girth of the dough was aspirational. <laughs> Plus, my gay brother is gay and no homosexual person worth his pink Himalayan sea salt keeps slice and bake cookie dough in his refrigerator. <laughs> he said, I think I have something at home that will work. And so, we sat at his kitchen table in his humble apartment on a sunny February day in Palo Alto, and he showed me the twist using a roll of sun-dried tomato polenta. <laughs> I have no memories of how gayer. my deployment of the twist went over or under, but I'll always have the fond memory of sharing that special moment with David. My brother has always, whenever I've needed it, given me a hand. <laughs> What are you giving me? Oh my God. Uh, wow. <laughs> no, it's all that aspirational. Is as <laughs> you know what, David? You've upgraded me because now, uh, 20 years later, this is organic. Uh. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to open it up for questions in just one second, but I have a, uh, a question. Questions for David. Yeah, exactly, for David. Dave, why don't you go up and demonstrate? Um, 
I've been listening to the audiobook for the last few days, Thank including you. on the car ride down. The audiobook is amazing, as you guys can tell by the way Faith tells stories and the way she reads, and her voice really comes through both in the book and in the audio. Now, you've had your own public radio show, you're on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. So what was doing the audiobook like, and how was that different than writing? Because I know that it was this performative element that comes through in that. I'm just curious about the experience of doing that. Um, thank you for listening, and um, you have to tell me, I do the worst Spanish, uh, Ecuadorian accent, it's oh, the worst! It sounds Korean. <laughs> she does. You try, you should do it, do your dog walker. I no, it's, it's, no, I would rather, it's horrible. So my, so we have a dog walker, um, no, not we, my husband has a dog, the dog lives in my home. Um, <laughs> I know I'm gonna lose you dog lovers here, but, Oh, this dog. So, <laughs> the best part about this dog is this wonderful man my, we call Uncle Juan. His name's Juan, but we've called him Uncle Juan since I had a baby, and now we have a two and a four year old. And Uncle Juan comes every day and walks the dog Corbin. And Uncle Juan is from Ecuador. And Uncle Juan, uh, uh, am I doing that? And Uncle Juan, is that better? Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, Uncle, Uncle Juan and I had, will you please read Uncle Juan? Because you could do the accent. Yeah, no, no I can't do it, it's horrible. <laughs> So it, I, it's sort of like the, the, the lady who, who gives you your dry cleaning. Um, <laughs> that's what it sounds like. It is horrible. Oh, it's worth getting the audiobook just to hear how bad that is. I do a pretty good um, Russian, Russian accent, Russian, really right? good. Yeah, yes, yeah, really I, do, good. I have a chapter called On the Fringe about the money I spend on eyelash extensions. Not anymore. These are mine. Um, like, enough to fund uh, probably a public radio station in North Dakota for a whole year I spent on that. And I'm not proud of it, uh, but they were great. And she was Russian, so I, I nailed that one. But um, I mean, ha, what's the process of even recording the audiobook? I mean, do you literally spend in, like days on end, or yeah. do you go in and just do chunks, or how is it? They, they say it's a hundred pages a day, um, and so I, for me it was three days. Um, and you go in and you bring your lozenges and your catheter, and and <laughs> wear comfy pants. <laughs> and um, it was so much fun. It was because I still. I still think of myself as an actor, yeah. a, a bangless actor trapped deep inside. You couldn't play herself, but now you're playing yourself. Right. Finally. It, it, was so, yeah. it, was, it was amazing how exhausting it was, though. It was, um, yeah, 100, 100 pages is a lot. I mean, it was seven hours a day. You do seven hours a day with, with a break for lunch. Um, but it was so fulfilling to, I don't know what's, am I holding Do you want to use mine? Um, it was so fulfilling to, thank you, to, um, to, to read it. And it, what was really interesting was the, there were two chapters that I got choked up reading, and I hadn't read it for a long time. I mean, it's like you hear about movie stars, they, they're promoting a movie like a, two years after they shot it, you know? By the time I did the audiobook for this, it was in January, I hadn't wanted to see these words for a while. Like, you know, you live with your book, you can't tell if it's... I could, by the time I turned this into my editor, I couldn't tell if it was the worst thing that was ever written or like, hilarious, you know? Um, hilarious. At, thank you. Um, <laughs> And, and so it was cool to revisit it while reading it out loud and not just reading it. And there's a chapter, there are two chapters where I got emotional reading it. And it was so gratifying. And, and one is called Overreachiever, um, which is about um, all that I went through to have my kids because I had them at 41 and 43 and, um, and with a lot of miscarriages. And in the last paragraph, I talk about how I thank the babies who were mine for weeks for pay, paving the way for the babies who are now mine for life and it, um, and it just always gets me. But then there's, and I thought I would get choked up in a chapter about my mom who died when I was 26, um, but I ended up getting choked up at, in this chapter about my dad. There's, um, there's a chapter called Bookmarked about this relationship I had with my dad my whole life through, through books through the books he would suggest that I read and the conversations we would have about, you know, the Scarlet Letter or Bleak House, and that's how we communicated, not in the same way I communicated with my mom. And my dad gave, so David and Mark, David's husband, my brother-in-law, um, had a um, baby shower for me uh, that was a book shower, um, and everybody brought books, and, you know, it was like Goodnight Moon and the Paper Bag Princess, and my dad sends two leather-bound copies uh, he sent Moby Dick, and he sent Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and he inscribed them to my son. And I know he sent those. He didn't have to say it. We talk through books. He sent them because I'm an old mom, and he's an old grandfather, and he books and literature mean so much to him that he wants to be there for my son when my son is old enough. Well, my son's about to 
do kindergarten admissions in Manhattan, so he better fucking be reading uh, <laughs> James Joyce in, in Mandarin. But, um, but at the end of that chapter, I imagine what it's going to be like when my son, you know, my dad will probably be gone when my son picks up those books. And that's, that's the legacy that, that he leaves them. And I told you what my dad used to say. I'm impressed, but not surprised. And at the end of that chapter, I say, you know, now that I'm a grown woman, my father's daughter has written a book of her own. And he's probably more surprised than impressed. But We've got just about five minutes left. So I just want to see if anyone had any questions for Faith. Questions? Uh, I'll ask. Uh, David, why don't you ask a question? How I'll put you on the spot. Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, 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 easy, uh, yeah. Easy question. Actually, I like yours about the audio tape. Do you stand or do you sit when you are when you are oh, taping? He, you sit. You sit. Is, it, is there a director there too? Yeah. There's a, yeah. There's a, there's a direct. You're in a small booth, and there's a director. There's a there's a in engineer who will talk to you about the technical stuff, like oh, you just popped your pee. Um, and then there's a director, um, and. Um, you know, because I had a performing background and because I'm on the radio, I, I, uh, I didn't need that much direction. But, I, but there were times when I really wanted direction. Like, you, you know, when you do things, that, it's like doing a stand-up routine. You know, there are different ways to deliver something, and you really want to rely on your audience whether something's funny or not. And it felt, it felt great if I could see them smile or laugh. Your director wasn't Latina, I can tell that, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hilarious. No, it's by it. Uh, how did you start working with CBS Sunday Morning? Oh, you know, there's a, there's a mention in the book. So this is great because it'll link me to Mario as well. Um, oh, and and oh, I did, I did want to go back to your, your mentioning my editor who kept telling me, you, you know this because you were my friend during this process. My editor did kept telling me to dig deeper. Um, and that's why, you know, at the end, I, I, I thank her very much. She, she edited Mindy Kaling's books and Jim Gaffigan and I've was in extremely good hands. Um, but like at the, 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 the Miss Aphrodite chapter you heard me read, that was like, at first it was just a Napoleon Dynamite chapter. Like, aren't these ridiculous things that we did in high school so hilarious? And she did ask me, like, why do you still like to tell people you're Miss Aphrodite? Like, what does that mean? And, and when she would push me, I would always think, oh, can't something just be funny? Or like, isn't it hilarious my brother taught me how to give a hand job? But she would say, well, what, really, what does that say that you asked your brother? That's so weird. And, and she helped me realize that that chapter was about intimacy. And, and then I realized myself, at least for me, intimacy is not, it, 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 it does not have to be sexual. Um, so, sorry, that was a digression. But thank God my editor made this more than it would have been. Um, Sunday morning, so Mo Rocca is a friend of mine from college. And um, uh, he played Charlie Brown to my Lucy in, in, in college. And uh, we were in an improv troupe together. And, when I moved to New York to start doing a radio show called Fair Game, that's when I left acting, um, a friend of mine, my college roommate, called and said, you need to meet my friend Mario Correa. I met, I met him through Mo. So Mario and Mo became best friends because neither of your mothers would let you take sex ed? Right. Yeah. She, she wouldn't sign the permission slip for sex ed. Neither of our moms would. No, it was, uh, it was a fifth grade. So we, we, we were put in a unit that had to square dance. Just, <laughs> just... Just the two of us, this, this Indian girl, and the, and, uh, and the lesbian gym teacher. And so if you add that up, one girl, no sex ed, that's how you both became gay, right? Right. <laughs> right. Um, so Mo is how I know Mario, and Mo um, suggests Mo was on um, Sunday morning, and he, I remember I was in Barcelona on vacation, and he called me one day, Mo, what is this? I'm on vacation. <laughs> and he said, he said, I think that you should write. I think Sunday morning needs um, like a, a young, funny female voice. And at the time, I might have been close to young. Um, and so I wrote some um, sample commentaries for the executive producer. And then they would let me do commentaries like once every few months. And it was kind of like an ongoing audition. Um, and there was one commentary I did called I Am Not a Pet Person which was the dumbest thing I've ever done. I thought it would be cute and cheeky. Um, be, I, this is so dangerous to say in, in front of a, a room full. I know you're all animal lovers. I love animals. I do. I love them. I just don't want a dog. And I didn't want my husband's dog, OK? So, 
So, uh, so they did. They used to do this animal show on Sunday morning about like, because am- animals do amazing things, right? Like dogs dial 911 and they sniff out cancer and stuff. And dogs are amazing. Yours is great. My husband sucks. And so, and so I thought it would be funny to do this commentary at the end of the show that was like, oh, you've heard all this cute stuff about animals, and I'm, you know, I'm not a pet person. Um, and so after I did that commentary, I got like hundreds of hate comments, hundreds. And I put a few in the book. Um, <laughs> yes, you hated me for that. Well, you never hated me, but you, you, I let Mario house sit and he let the dog sleep in the bed. <laughs> but, I also told him to edit this book out. Of the, this he told me to edit it out. But there was this one woman who wrote in, her name was Pam. <clears throat> this was my favorite. I would like to give Faith a cigarette to calm her down after her I don't want pets segment on CBS Sunday morning. In in fact, I'll be happy to give her a case of cigarettes, (laughs) apostrophe S. My boyfriend would be perfect for you. He doesn't like pets either, nor does he like women who own dogs. You're both skinny and uptight, find disgust in everything that you do not produce. Others see your disgust, they are just too kind, a trait learned from dogs. to tell you about your scrawny, disgusting persona you cherish and foist on others. I think there are rescue agencies for people like Faith and my boyfriend. It's called the Russian Space Program. Join it, the planet would be better off without you. (laughs) Sincerely, Pam. And I wrote her back, I wrote her back and I said, thank you for thinking that I'm skinny and, And I'm marrying a man with two dogs, and she wrote me right back, and she was like, well, you're not so bad, but my boyfriend's the worst. So one, more. one more question? And no, we're good to go. Congratulations. Oh, we have a, Oh, we do. Okay. Um, knows they want to write a map point. Oh, well... I w- first of all, you said you're 25, so my first piece of advice, and I'm not even trying to be funny, is freeze your eggs tomorrow. <laughs> I'm telling you, everybody in this room, freeze your eggs. Even you, Katie, you're pregnant, freeze your eggs. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, I, w- I would say, well, f- first of all, it's amazing that you're 25 and already know you want to write a memoir. What's happened to you? Have remark. I mean, uh, that's that's great. Make sure you live a remarkable life. Like, like seriously. Like, say yes to almost everything. Um, not to my ex-husband if he asked you to marry him. But you're probably you're probably too old for him now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> did I mention that writing this book was very healing? <laughs> um, um, I, I bet you already do this. If you already know you want to write, then you're probably writing and and write write journals, write, 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 write down everything, write down the things you're like, I will never, I will never forget this, this happened to me, I don't need to write it down, write it down, write down what somebody said, write down what you thought, it was so helpful and um, uh, harrowing for me to return to my journals from my, from my first marriage, Um, uh, and and actually, it really was healing, but, um, but there are things that I read that I was like, I, had only vague memories of it happening, as if it happened to somebody else. Um, so write down everything. I mean, I even do that with my kids now. If, if you're a parent, you know that your ki- kids say the darndest things, and they say the cutest things, and you're like, I will never forget this hilarious thing. And then two days later, because you're sleep deprived, you're like, what was that amazing, like, brilliant thing that my son said? And if you, you just write it down, write everything down, and, and take really big risks. Thank you so much, Mario. Thank you. Congratulations. And Faith will be signing books right there.